at Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and today we concluded a study of Joel and we're just pressing on, right? And we're going to get to Revelation eventually, I'm hoping before Jesus comes and we're looking at some amazing passages. We're not always going verse by verse, but we're picking out whole lot I'm combining two words again, highlights and lowlights of various sections of scripture. Highlights because God is blessing his people. Lowlights because some people made some really poor choices and God needed to make sure they understood that that's not acceptable. And so there was a penalty. There was a, a punishment for that. And you see that, that cycle occurring a lot of times. And <coughs> excuse me, allergy season has hit with a vengeance up here. <coughs> but one of the things that I especially like to do as we're going through these cycles of study and the, the highlights and the lowlights and the good days and the bad days for the people of God, I'm always trying to ask myself the question, why is this passage here? What can be in this to bless me, to admonish me, to help me, to help all of us? And there are some marvelous 2018 applications from Genesis to Revelation, our Bible, I hope when you're searching the scriptures, you're always looking for those kinds of passages that can, that can prop us up, that can encourage us when we're down, that can keep us going when we're flying high, and just give us all the, the wisdom, the instruction, the guidance, the correction, all that we need to be more effective as the servants of God. One thing I especially also like looking for are passages that are especially unique maybe even obscure. And, and we came through a while back, the, the book of 1 Samuel. And we, we spent a little time in 1 Samuel chapter 6. And I want to revisit the first part of that, that chapter and then move on into another section of that chapter which <coughs> has some information there for us that will certainly make our, our investment and our time of study this evening very beneficial. This will be a study, I hope, when we look back on it, we say, yeah, that's something that helped me. That's something that's going to help me this week. That's something that's going to strengthen me maybe for the rest of my life. These obscure passages are not obscure because they're unimportant. They're obscure oftentimes because they're unexplored. So let's with enthusiasm examine this particular passage, and then we're going to move on beyond this to something else in the, in the whole context of 1 Samuel chapter 30. <coughs> Verses 1 through 6. Look at this with me, please. Now it came, now it happened, depending on your translation, when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites... Just about any time you read your Old Testament and you see a name ending in ites, these are bad behaving people. There are exceptions. Israelites oftentimes were not bad behaving people, but usually the ite crowd was folks that would get you in trouble. So the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag. They attacked Ziklag and burned it, notice, burned it with fire. You've seen the images from California, how terrible fire can be. How destructive. They burned it with fire and had taken captive <coughs> the women and those who were there. Notice, from small to great. From small to great, they did not kill anyone. That's the good news. But carried them away and went their way. So David is king. He's powerful. He's entrusted with protecting cities like Ziklag. In fact, it's a very important place. That's where his family lived. So this matters to him, verse 3. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was burned with fire, and their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. What a scary scene to come upon. They probably did not originally know that their families had been taken captive. They rightly probably presumed initially that our children, our families have perished in these horrible flames. <coughs> but somehow they understand our families are not here. They've been taken away. And notice the reaction, verse 4. Then David 
And the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept. That's a reasonable reaction to bad news. Until they had no more power. They cried until they could not cry any longer. You ever done that? Had no more power to weep. And David's two wives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, <coughs> the Carmelite, you've seen a couple of ites again, bad behaving people, had been taken captive. Now, David, understandably, was greatly distressed. Why? For the people spoke of stoning him. Because the soul of all the people was grieved. When we're grieved, when we're upset, we're not ourselves. We say things we shouldn't say sometimes. We think things we shouldn't think. We behave in ways that maybe we shouldn't. And they're doing that. They're grieving, right? Every man for his sons and his daughters. And here is an amazing word from God. But David strengthened himself. In the Lord is God. Worst day in David's life, maybe. Now, he's had some bad days. That's why I had the word maybe there. <coughs> and he is woefully discouraged. He's discouraged. He's brokenhearted. Because the city he was in charge of protecting has been ransacked and burned to the ground. He's distraught, number two, because his wives and his children have been stolen away. He's distraught, number three, because the people want to kill him. Again, I would suggest probably he's never been any lower in his life than at this moment. And what does he need? What do we need when we're at low moments of our life? We need something to rally us. We need strength. And you notice here in this obscure section of Scripture, David strengthened himself in the Lord. Why? There was nobody else to strengthen him. This morning in our lesson, we were, we were thinking about the value of helping other people, considering other people, encouraging people, inspiring people, provoking others to love and to good works and Again, the whole concept of just helping other people to be stronger, to have a better relationship with God. And that's the, the task to which we've been assigned by our Heavenly Father. So if, if we have people in our lives and, and life has kind of blown out their candles, well, we didn't do it. It's not our fault, but it's our privilege to step in and try to relight those candles of those who are darkened hearted. And our encouragement to others. It, it needs to be heartfelt. It needs to be genuine. Y'all remember I told some of you this on an occasion not all that long ago. We were talking about sports and sports analogies. And I, I mentioned to you that I, I used to play basketball. Actually, I sat on the bench more than I should. Had a had a, a coach who just could not identify real talent. Maybe you had a coach like that a time or two or ten, and, and I did. One of my buddies, uh, Russell Figgins, he's a Facebook friend of mine. He may be watching this tonight. We actually sat on the bench together in our assigned seats, if you will. We actually brought pillows to the game one night to sit on the pillows, and our coach just ignored us again. You know how coaches have this little clipboard they look at and they write plays on during timeout. Before the game, Russell and I wrote in big letters, put Russell and Jeff in. That was our suggestion. And, of course, our coach ignored that also. And so that was kind of my career. <coughs> I know you're surprised by that. In, uh, in basketball in high school, and <coughs> our, our, our friends and, and cheerleaders and all after the game, they'd walk past us in a little line, and they would, they would, they would tell, me, they'd tell me, great game. And, and that was wrong. I didn't have a great game. I didn't have a bad game. I didn't have a game. I didn't, I didn't get in the game. But they were trying to be encouraging, and, and, and they meant well, but it, it, it wasn't really a sincere thing because it wasn't something they observed. It was just words they're saying. And, and, and we, we need to be sincere, genuine, and persistent in our strengthening of others because we may not 
know people who have endured what David here is enduring, but we know people who at least are cousin to this kind of experience, and everybody processes bad stuff, bad days, bad news in different ways, so what might be something you could shake off quite easily, somebody else is, I mean, their faith is really challenged by this event. And again, David, he's a man who needed encouragement because of what was happening in his life, in the life of his family, in the life of his, of his nation. And whenever we are able to genuinely encourage somebody like a David, think of it this way. It's like we're able to, with the help of God, transform their sobs into songs. We, we're able to actually help them again to believe in sunrises. We're, we're actually able to help them be, to believe and to know that life is going to get better, that just because we have a bad day, we don't have to have a bad week have a bad week, we don't have to have a bad life. Have a bad morning doesn't mean we have to have a bad day. I mean, just because something starts out or turns into a negative way, <coughs> we're not obligated to remain in that kind of storm. I have noticed, and so have you, that the devil uses the weapon of discouragement to, to hurt God's people, to weaken God's people. Many of those that we read about in our Bible, their failings were frequently because they, they had just lost the conviction that they're able to be pleasing to God. They, they lost their courage. They lost their enthusiasm for the task. You remember, I briefly referenced this morning, I didn't highlight the passage, it's, it's Matthew 25, the parable of those three men with the three different degrees of talents. Remember why the one talent man buried, hid his talent? He was afraid. He was afraid that he would lose the one talent if he invested it, and it was a fear of failure that led him to fail. And only if he had somebody maybe just to encourage him and say, you can get it done. By the way, <coughs> one thing that impresses me about the other two fellows who do, did invest and did please their master, they didn't let the discouraged one-talent man infect them and their attitude. We gotta be careful about hanging out with negative people because it's really contagious. And if one person's oh, that's a bad idea, I'm not gonna do that, I'm not gonna be involved in that. Then the second person who thought, well, I thought it was a good idea, but now that they've said it's a bad idea, I'm gonna rethink it and I'm not gonna do it if they're not gonna do it. It's just apathy can 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 be like a, like a, a leprosy. It, it can spread quickly, it can infect a lot of people. So we gotta be careful the type of attitudes that we choose to I'll use this microphone. This one's giving me, I think this one's allergic to, to my uh, condition also. Now, getting back to David. David could have said, he could have said, I'm a great shepherd. And that could have encouraged him. And that was true. David could have said to himself, I'm a great soldier. And that's true. But he didn't do that. <coughs> he could have said, I'm a fantastic poet. But he didn't say that, even though that would have been true. He needed help that, that would come from a source, not just within himself, but that was bigger than him. And, and that, that's why it's so important that this verse 9 has told us, David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. It was divine encouragement. It was a divine strength. It was divine gift from the Father that made him better. I mean, if, 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 if your, your, your family has been stolen away, your hometown's been burned to the ground, and people want to stone you till you're dead, you need God. And we need God even on our best days. So certainly we need Him on our worst days. <coughs> Think about this with Jesus. He is Son of God. He made all of this, he made all of us. What couldn't he do? He could walk on water. He could raise the dead. He could come up out of the grave himself. I mean, just anything good that needed to be done, Jesus could do it. And even Jesus himself needed to be encouraged by his Father. You remember one of the worst days in the life of Jesus happened in John 6. 
where he's been feeding these people, he's been loving them, he's been teaching them, he's going to be dying soon to save them, and they start turning away from him one by one. Eventually, remember, he turns to his 12 that are still with him and said, will you also go away? Peter is so prone to put his foot in his mouth and say the wrong thing, finally gets it right. He asks, to whom shall we go? I mean, you're the best available option for us and then some. You have the words of life. And he said, he said it with conviction. We believe and we are sure about that. <coughs> but shortly after that, and I don't know if it's because these things were still on Christ's mind. When you get over into John chapter 8, men are continuing to hate him. Men are continuing to abandon him. But in verse 24 of John 8, we understand that he is strengthened in knowing what? That his father is with him. These others may scatter, but his father, God, would always be a part of him. And then we got to have the same conviction. So let us also be comforted in understanding that, that is there something wrong with me because I need encouragement, because I need, I need strength from others. I need the prayers of others. Am I defective in some way? Was well, Jesus? <coughs> because he also needed. And remember, even when he was being tempted by the devil, the devil departed after three failures. Remember the text says he departed for a season. Then the angels came and did what? They ministered to Jesus. They tried to strengthen the Son of God. If I were to ask you, who's the strongest person you know of in the New Testament outside of Jesus Christ? Most of us would say the Apostle Paul. I mean, who was stronger than him? He was, he was a man's man, and then some. But there was a time in Acts 23 when, I mean, he's being, he's, his world is being rocked. He is about to endure yet another shipwreck. You know, he was on three different boats that sank. Just kind of a little advice back for those days. If you see Paul getting on a ship, don't get on that ship. I mean, that's just a bad idea. But in Acts 23, as he's seemingly needing to be fortified, an angel appears to him with the great message, fear not. And, and, and Paul rallied. His, his spirits were boosted. <coughs> think about another, uh, the, the strongest that we would think of in in our New Testament, I mean, Stephen. I mean, who was more courageous in telling the wicked people of his, his community, you're wicked people. You've killed the Son of God. You're in trouble for that. And remember, the reaction was, I mean, these people were so hate-filled that they bit on him with their, their teeth. They dragged him out of the city. How hypocritical was that? They believed if they killed him on this side of the, the city limits, it was some kind of violation of God's law, but they could drag him on the outside of the gate, kill him, and no problem. Stephen's lowest moment was also his highest moment. As they're killing him, remember, he, he cries out, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. But you remember that as he's going through this toughest of times, he looks up into the heavens and he doesn't see a vast void up there. He doesn't see emptiness. He doesn't see a bunch of clouds. He sees Jesus not, not sitting in a, um, an uncaring type of posture like this. doesn't matter. I'm indifferent to this. But Jesus is standing. It's like Jesus is standing with Stephen. It's like he's encouraging him, saying, you're not going through this alone. And no doubt seeing Jesus that fills Stephen with an amazing degree of calm so that he could say, lay not this sin to the charge. And because he was comforted and strengthened, remember, he likely, in those words, planted a seed in the, in the very hard heart of Saul, who was there witness holding the coats and assisting in this execution of an innocent man. And probably that's a scene that Saul, who became Paul, never got out of his mind. Probably those words... <coughs> <laughs> that Stephen said that day were continuing to resonate, were unforgettable. Did that man really say to God, he wants me to be forgiven for what I'm participating in? Maybe he was a good man who was not worthy of what we just put him through. Even 
Even Peter. Even Matthew. Even Thomas. And we could just go on with so many different examples. Of people in our Bible. That needed and received strength from God. And, and, and where I'm going with all this. Is one of the ways that, that we receive strength from God today. Is through the people of God. Be that person who is a strength for other folks and, and be a person who's also looking for strength from the people of God. Look for encouragement. Look for a blessing. Look for fortification. Look for a godly example. Surround yourself with people who care enough for you to, to share their strength, to share their energy, to share their passion, to share their godliness with you because at times... Maybe even the strongest among us, our, our spiritual fuel tanks will run a little bit lower than they ordinarily would. And we need to be replenished with good people. <coughs> Remember Joshua? He's following the greatest leader of the Old Testament, Moses. Can you imagine following that man? You'd rather be the one who follows that man than the one who follows that man. And the whole first chapter of the book of Joshua, the theme of it is be strong, be courageous, do not be afraid, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And that strength from God, it, it fortified that man, and it made him a dynamic leader. He is the one who was in charge, of course God's above him, but in charge whenever the people finally made it to the promised land. If you look at it on a map, it's like from here to Montgomery in distance that they had to cover from getting from Egypt to the promised land. It took them 40 years to get there because they're pretty weak. They're pretty easily swayed. And it took 40 years to get the negativity out of them, to get the dust of Egypt off of them so they could finally go triumphantly with God, with Joshua's man, into the promised land. Listen to David. This is Psalm 55, verse 22. He's able to say this from experience. He says, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. And then real similar, almost a parallel passage to that is something Peter said in 1 Peter 5, 7. <coughs> cast all your care on the Lord for he cares for you. We have much to do. There are many people in the Lord's church who at times begin to, to get weaker and, and at times begin to stray from the source, the vine, the source of strength. Our doing in their direction is to try to strengthen and, and help maintain and, and more firmly fix that connection to the vine. There are people who have never come to the vine, who have never come to Jesus our privilege is to go and pursue them and help them to come. There are, there are people that are sick. Our privilege is to try to minister to their needs. There are people who have legitimate poverty. Our privilege is to, to help them <coughs> have food, have clothing, have access to heat in the winter and cooler air in the summertime. There are people who are dealing with financial challenges, with family challenges, with all variety of challenges. I, I highlighted some of those this morning. There, there is so much to do. There are so many visits to make. There are so many souls to, to encourage. There are so many weeds to pull and, and flowers to plant and lessons to teach and, and feet to wash that we need to be encouraged to know we can do this and we should do this and God will not withhold from us the ability to get that job done. And as we do this, Let's do it with a smile. Let's do this with the strength we receive from our Father and then determine to pass along the strength we receive from Him to all those around us in our circles of love and influence. It's an obscure passage, but it's pretty powerful. If you move on, and my throat is not going to allow me to move on with you too much, but I do just want you, I want you to look at this in your later study. <coughs> but... If you look at verse 10 in Paul, you see this is a story that does have a happy ending. David learns from God that he can go after these people that have stolen his family and the other families and children and get them back. 
And so he, he takes about 600 men. He goes after them. You see there in verse 10, he pursues. And, and 200 of them, they just, they're just worn out. They're covering about, if you do the math here, it's about 70 miles in three days. And they're, they're not just running without a backpack. They're, they're running with, with heavy loads, their artillery, their, their, what they would call their artillery, their armaments for the battle. And, and so it's exhausting, and 200 of them just, they got to stop, and, and, and they can't go. David and his troops eventually catch up with these fellows, the, the bad guys, the Amalekites. They, they wipe them out. They recover their families. They recover everything that was stolen in the town of Ziklag before it was burned to the ground. And then, I think it's pretty interesting, <coughs> when they all covey back up together, all 600 with their families and all, it's a time of rejoicing and celebrating and some of those who went and fought the Amalekites of the 400, they don't want to share the bounty with the 200 that were exhausted and stayed back at the brook and, and took care of the baggage while the others went ahead to fight. And I love David. I love David's attitude. He, he, he indicates to them that those who remained behind and kind of did, did what was done not in the limelight but were behind the curtain in a sense. Those were just as worthy, just as important as those who were on the front lines fighting. And they got the same share as those who went out and did the actual taking back of the possessions and the families. Whether we're out front or whether we're staying with the baggage, whoever we are, whatever we're doing to the glory of God in the family of our Father matters, as I mentioned this morning. Everybody gets eternal life. Everybody gets remission of sins. Everybody gets entrance into a heaven that has no exits. And we need to, again, not diminish our importance to God's family. And especially, we've looked at something tonight that everybody can do. Everybody can do this and should do this. Everybody can be a source of strength for other people. Everybody can say an encouraging word. Everybody can smile. Everybody can help other people. That's not something God's told us to do that's beyond our grasp. We can do it. We can do it enthusiastically, and we can do it fruitfully. People will be blessed when we commit to strengthening others, being a source of strength that comes originally from God through us to all those around us. Would you bow with me, please? Father, thank you so much for the strength that, that I personally receive from being associated with the good people that belong to this family. Thank you, God, for the encouragers that are here. <coughs> thank you, Father, for obscure passages that we've looked at tonight. We're, we're understanding that as David was strengthened from you, we also get great resources, great strength from you we we have from you everything we need to be effective godly people thank you god for supplying all our needs help us father to pass along to all others what you have given to us help us to look for opportunities to to help mend a broken heart to lift up someone who's down help us father to be thankful for our blessings help us to understand we have been blessed to be a blessing to as many people as possible in whatever time we have left here on this planet. Father, if we need prayers tonight, help, to help us to seek them. If we need to be immersed in water, having all our sins washed away in the blood of Christ, in obedience to the teaching of Jesus in John 3, verse 3, verse 5, verse 7, the teaching of Paul in Romans 6, 3, and 4, help us to take that great action this evening. In Jesus we pray, amen. If we can help you, would you come while we stand?